Welcome to the Christ Connection Podcast. We are here to help and encourage you to enjoy your adventure with Jesus. I'm your host, Kevin Senapati Ratna. Let the journey begin. Well, welcome to episode number 15 of the Christ Connection Podcast. It's hard to believe we're already at episode 15. I feel like I'm just getting started with this. Uh, But we're having fun, and I think now that we're uh, into kind of around the corner with 15, we're going to do some other fun stuff as well that I've been uh, kind of been waiting for. And this episode will fall into that category. Uh, My guest today is Ron Roosh. Now, you may have not heard of Ron. Uh, His uh, maybe gone under the radar. He hasn't written uh, a book or gone yet. He hasn't written a book yet. (laughs) And he's uh, also not uh, pastored some large church somewhere that you might have heard of. Uh, But Ron is an amazing guy. Uh, He is uh, at my home church. It's one of the pastoral staff there. And uh, one of his roles is discipleship. And before you uh, jump off thinking, I don't know this guy. I don't know why I'm going to listen to. uh, We have a fun conversation. And he is uh, what I would call a master disciple maker. He is all about discipling, uh, especially discipling men, and very practical. And I've seen him do it. I've seen his uh, his work uh, around uh, the church that I attend. And what we're going to do with this episode is I have a conversation where he tells his story. Now, I, I love a good detective uh, show or a book, you know, Sherlock Holmes trying to follow the clues. And uh, what you're going to hear is the story of one man who has become an amazing discipler. And as you hear this story, let me encourage you to look for clues, not just sit back and, oh, let's just listen to a story and miss the, 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 you know, this detail. I don't know about this detail. I want you to kind of Sherlock Holmes-ish, uh, lean forward, lean in, and listen for what it is that made him who he is today. There are some amazing clues there that I believe if you catch them, you will notice what they need in your own life, you need in your own life in order to... Uh, become a better disciple maker, become a better discipler, become a be, uh, better disciple of Jesus in the process. So uh, so put on your uh, Sherlock hat and uh, listen in on this conversation. You'll notice I, I laugh a lot. I, I, Ron and I, we, we have a good fun uh, little banter uh, relationship there. So uh, that's uh, what's going on there. But uh, sit back, relax, uh, but at the same point, lean in and then I, let me encourage you, when you find, maybe pick out two or three things that you're like, this made him uh, who he is, uh, find me on social media, Christ Connection or Enjoying Prayer, and let me know. Let me see, uh, see your Sherlock skills. Uh, tell me what are those two or three things that uh, impacted his life that made him a disciple maker, uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing. So without further ado, my conversation with Ron Roosh. Well, Ron, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. It is a treat to have you here today and to get down and chat. Uh, Just to set a context for people who don't know you, I have known you for the last few years now, and you moved here from Michigan, Uh, but I know your two sons. I know Nate from, I like to say, when he came off the boat from Michigan back in the... (laughs) (laughs) Cause he, it's called the motherland. The motherland. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So I, I I met him shortly uh, after he came to Emmanuel. Uh, right. He was still a student leader, uh, and he would come to my he came, my parents invited him over for Kentucky Fried Chicken once uh, back when he was a college student. He slept on the couch before in between services. So known him for a long time, and then I think I met your daughter at that point briefly i mean i we, she wouldn't even know who i am probably but then uh david was my small group leader for a couple really uh, yeah the last couple of years ago that's uh, right so i got i got all the connections there <laughs> that's right <laughs> so how, how long has it been that you've moved from michigan we came here in 2014 so it'll be four and a half years four and, a half. and what's your official title here 
A pastoral care and discipleship. Pastoral care and discipleship. Yes. Which Focus on discipleship. We've done amazing things around here. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Living a dream. Uh, yeah. um, I drove truck for uh, 15 years, a semi. Wow. And did ministry and discipled men whenever I was home. And uh, then I came off the road and God brought us here and I'm living the dream. I'm semi retired, no pun intended. Came right off. Yep, came off the. Yes. Why not, not pun intended? I think that pun was kind of intended. <laughs> so, so uh, were you raised in a Christian home? Yes, my father was a pastor. I was raised in Sterling, Illinois, about 100 miles west of Chicago. And uh, my dad pastored in Sterling, Illinois for. 22 years, uh, pioneered three churches, and so uh, I was I was the kid learning from from dad. So yeah. <laughs> and and then did you go right into the ministry out of high school? Or? I graduated from high school in 197, uh, 1966, and uh, went to Chicago Bible College, a small school in Chicago. Um, right. Right from my senior year, I was just graduated about a month, went to Chicago, got a job, lived on campus, and on the north side of Chicago, about four blocks from Wrigley Field. So I was a Cub fan at the time, <laughs> but really my team is Yankees. So anyway, yeah, figure that out. So that's where I met my wife. I went to school for four years, and she came my junior year in high school, in uh, college, and uh, yeah, then the rest is history. The rest is history. Well, I, and you pastored uh, multiple churches, right? Correct. Yeah, we went to Lyman, Colorado. That was my first pastor, and uh, that was interesting. <laughs> it was. I was. I was that young guy out of just out of college, twenty-two, just married. I graduated uh, on a Friday, May twenty-fifth. Um, the next weekend, I'm in Kansas planning the wedding with my wife's mother, and my wife was in Davenport, Iowa, recuperating from mono. Wow. And so, and then she came. We were, mar- we were married on June 13th. I left on uh, Monday the 15th for Eau Claire, Wisconsin, to be ordained in that fellowship. So it was a whirlwind <laughs> Uh, and there's a lot of stories connected to that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, then we were there for a year. I learned that uh, I didn't know everything. As a, as a young pastor, you know, I got out of college thinking, you know, the sun rose and set on me. <laughs> Did I learn quick? You know, I had some fine, uh, wonderful, wonderful presbyters that uh, uh, took me to the woodshed, so to speak, and uh, corrected me and kind of steered me in the right way. Oh, I could tell you stories about that. But And then we went from Colorado back to Chicago, and my wife were involved in Des Plaines, Illinois, at a, um, it was a church reboot. It wasn't necessarily a church plant. For example, I would tell everybody when we went there, there were 14 people, and they were all in the same family. Wow. Two weeks after we moved there, they moved to North Carolina. So my church went from 14, <laughs> plus my wife and I, to zip. Wow. So we spent our time uh, in the community going door to door. I got a job at a gas station, and several of the people that came through the gas station won to the Lord, and they became part of the church. And, um, yeah, so we were there two and a half, about two and a half years in Des Plaines. And I made some wonderful mistakes Again, as a young pastor. Wonderful mistake. Oh, well, yeah. And that's a story in itself. Um, yeah. But anyway, we moved from uh, Des Plaines, Illinois. And by that time, when we, by the time we left there, it was about 50, 55 people. Wow. Coming. It, was, it was solid. And I was, I was asked to leave, actually. You and were asked to leave? I was asked to leave. Uh, the, <laughs> They're all people that you brought in and you were asked to leave? Well, I was not a wise pastor with my mouth, okay? And some of my friends couldn't tell you that, too, at the time. 
But God was tempering me and maturing me, and God was keeping putting men in my life that would um, disciple me. And even at that time, I didn't realize it was discipleship, but they were pouring into me, and I call it tempering me, you know, tempering the metal, because <laughs> <laughs> I, I could get hot. Oh. Yeah, and my mouth got myself in trouble, really. Anyway, we moved from uh, Des, Plain, uh, Des Plaines to DeKalb, Illinois, and I became a college pastor um, in an open Bible church. And so I was ordained in that organization, and um, it was a wonderful. I, had, that, I look back at that, it was a wonderful experience. Um, I was asked to be the college and high school pastor. So my responsibility was is to raise up at that time, they called them sponsors to help with the uh, ministries. And then I went on campus and I found two professors that were really strong Christians, and they wanted to do a Bible study on Sunday morning. Well, in that days, they expected the, everybody to come to the church. And so I was kind of out of the box then. And by the way, I'd grow my hair long. I was a hippie, basically. I wore leather. I wore this leather vest and jeans, and which was not necessarily acceptable, you know. Um, this is a good people, picture. I like this yeah. picture. <laughs> but people loved me, loved me anyway. And so when we came into that scene, I fit the college scene, and the youth group grew, the high school group grew, and then the college those scene really grew. And God, I was starting at that time to begin to understand what discipleship is all about. Um, my head was all over the place. Uh, I, by this time, I figured out, and God helped me figure out, it wasn't about me. It was about the kingdom of God. It was about Jesus. And so God sent many, many college students that are in the ministry today, because uh, not because of me, but you know, all my mistakes and stumbling around, somehow they got it straight. And uh, there was one particular young man, his name is Jim Stapleton, if I could use his name. Uh, I remember him coming to uh, the college group on campus. It wasn't Chi Alpha, it was just a group. And uh, he would look on at us and say, so what do you Christians do anyway to have fun, you know, and things like that. And I remember he got saved. And I invited him to my house for breakfast every Saturday. So he didn't know how to pray. And it, the first time he showed up, and I said, so let's pray. And we bowed his head, and I says, no, we're going to be doing it different, Jim. Keep your eyes open. Just, and then I said, see this chair across the kitchen table? Jesus is sitting there. And when I said that, his eyes got big <laughs> like this, like, I don't, and he says, I don't see him. I said, yeah, but he's there. And so we prayed with our eyes open. And then I talked to him about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit want to um, uh, invest in him and to overflow out of his life. And he might even speak a heavenly language now and then. And he said, no, nah, it's not for me. Now, this is a true story. So he went back to his dorm. They had this is a college a campus of about 50,000 students at that time. And so the large dormitories. Well, he told me the story the following Saturday. He left, and every day he would go out by a, a tree that was out in front of the dorm, and he would sit there. And he would say, okay, Holy Spirit, I want to I wanna know, I want to see you, and I want, I want you to talk to me. And he said, students going by, hearing him talk like that, they thought it was nuts. He said, but about the sixth day, he's just worshiping God, telling God, the Holy Spirit, the same thing, and all of a sudden, he said, I began to speak in one of those crazy languages. <laughs> and to hear him tell the story, it just, and he went on and into the ministry, right. and I don't know, I've, I've lost contact, that's a few years ago, if you know what I mean. <laughs> But tremendous experiences. But then I wasn't ready for what God did next. So I told you that God had always been putting men in my life to pour into me. 
Well, this Church of Christ pastor, Daryl Malcolm is his name, he um, knew me through a fellowship. There was about seven churches that would get together in the community and have, like the old time Singspirations. Um, I'm dating myself now. <laughs> and uh, and we'd have communion together, all seven churches. And that's where I would meet him. And I, I've I've done those singspirations though when I was first pastoring, so it must it must be a <laughs> it just depends on where you are. Yeah, but you're a little younger than me. That's, well, I know, so I'm saying it. <laughs> it's still around someplace. <clears throat> the singspiration. Ah, oh, the church is growing. <laughs> so, so um, he he called me and says, "Hey, uh, I'd like to talk to you." I said, "Sure." He says, "Well, I'm going to come over to your house." I said, "Oh, pastor inviting himself to my house." <laughs> So we invited him and his wife over, Karen, on a Monday night. We had coffee, and he talked to me about uh, asking me to join him in a community uh, men's class that he was teaching by Ron Wellingham, which was basically a class where he teach men to, how to stand up and how to talk in public in, in a church, read scripture, give your testimony, um, pray. I said, sure. What do I have to do? And he says, well, I'm going to come every Monday night to your house, and we'll plan the meeting, and the meeting will be on Wednesday. So I said, cool. Here's another pastor invested in me. And so the way we started out was he said, this is, this is the program. There's going to be about 25 men. And he said, they're going to come in and register. You're going to register them. Then when you're done registering, I want you to come to the front and just start the meeting out. Well, I thought, I'm used to maybe standing up and blubbing something, you know? So I, that's, that's the way we started out. And then he's gradually, before the end of the seven weeks, I'm the one doing everything, <laughs> and he's in the back of the room, you know? And it was, it was just a great experience, but meeting with him every Monday night, we built such a bond. And he's Church of Christ. I'm Pentecostal background. I'm thinking, this guy, what's, what's, what's the deal? But the, his life was like Jesus. You ever meet somebody like that? It's like, this guy lived next to Jesus. That's the way I looked at it. Just his whole countenance. Well, I have talked to you before, so I'm, I'm used to it. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yeah, way to go. Uh, so... After that experience, the seven weeks, he came to me. He said, we're going to do a debriefing. I said, sure. So for two Mondays, he came over to the house, and he had a different kind of demeanor about him. And I knew he was kind of fishing. You ever had somebody talk to you, and they're kind of fishing for answers and kind of poking around? And he was like, he was asking me <laughs> questions so how are things going at the church where you're at? How's your ministry? What's God saying to you? I'm saying, I'm loving it. I'm working on a college campus, got high school students. I mean, living a dream. He says, well, I talked to my church board, and we'd like for you to consider coming to the Church of Christ, which was two blocks away, and becoming our Christian ed director. Uh-oh. Now, if you knew anything about me, I'd never done Christian education, tr- uh, you know, in church. I mean, I'm teaching, yeah. But he went, this is Church of Christ. So I went to my pastor, Lloyd Blatton, at the time, and I said, Lloyd, Daryl, you know Daryl, yeah. He just asked me this, and it blew me away. Daryl looks at me and says, well, must be the Lord. <laughs> It blew me away. I'm saying, I'm on your staff, Lloyd. And you're saying, well, it must be the Lord. Well, God had been talking to Lloyd, and he felt that, uh, Pastor Blatton felt that God was moving me on. And this plays into who I am. So I move over to, it was crazy. The Open Bible Church had a big sending off for us. Wow. Okay. No negative anything about it. Everyone's excited. 
So the next Sunday, we're two blocks away at the Church of Christ. Wow. And so we spent two years then at the Church of Christ. And at the same time, I've always been bivocational. So I worked at a company called Sealy Posturepedic, and I became a manager in the business there. And, and some of them came to church, obviously, and got saved. It was awesome. But I, here I'm in a church of Christ, and he'd have me preach once a month. And people get saved. Well, Daryl, though, was hungry for God. And he says, you know, in our fellowship, we don't believe in speaking in tongues. He says, but don't tell anybody, I do. <laughs> he says, would you pray for me that I would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It just really humbled me. I remember that day I cried. Here's a young man, young minister, hippie, and he's asking me to pray for him. And I prayed for him, and he just very sweetly received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence. He spoke in tongues. And it was so sweet, so sweet. From there, um, I worked for Sealy, and they asked me to transfer either to Wisconsin or Michigan. And uh, I had an uncle at the time that lived in Shelby, Michigan, north of Muskegon. And so I said, hey, it's got to be Michigan. <laughs> Before we go there, okay. like, you, you said there was something about that transition there between the two churches that was f- – formative of who you were uh, it goes back to my dad my dad is was a pioneer um he would start something and turn it over to somebody else okay um so that was i was watching that from my dad that got in my dna even before i understood what discipleship was or raising up leaders and so um i was working for Sealy. they asked me to go to they gave me a choice so i went to Michigan, and we landed in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and we were still in the Church of Christ. We, we uh, went to a Church of Christ in Kentwood, Michigan, and they accepted us. Even the, the pastor, Ken Hickerson, he says, I'm so glad you're here. He says, I got crazies in my church. I said, <laughs> this is over supper. We had a mess. He says, I don't know what to do with them. They something happens to them and they talk about this baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and they get all joy and giggly. He says, I don't know what to do with them. Would you stay here and help us straighten them out? That's what he said. And he said very humbly, and it wasn't like, how do I get rid of these? He was being honest. And I said, well, Kent, I'd be, we'd be honored to come alongside of you and do whatever we can do to help. And I said the word, you're crazy. <laughs> and, but, so we were there for another two, two and a half years. And God used us there. We were, grew in Christ. But there were two young men on staff, Andy Hansen and Kent. Uh, um, he was, there were just two young men on staff. One was a, uh, the Christian ed director and one was uh, youth. These guys invited and they actually discipled me. They asked me to show up at Fables, which was a restaurant in Grand Rapids, a lot of them in western Michigan. There were 14 other guys. We had one whole wing of the restaurant. These guys would come in with Bibles, commentaries, journals, spread them out on the <laughs> table, and Andy and Kent would teach us from the Word. But it was a different style. It wasn't like they were going by verse, by verse, by verse. They would introduce a subject, and then they would ask us to find out, like, meanings of Greek words and Hebrew words and how to apply it. And I said, this is good. And so the next thing I know is they were asking me to do it. <laughs> I says, you're doing a great job. No, we want you to do it, but we want you to do it with the college and career class. So we started teaching this college and career class, my wife and I, and it was for four months, it was great. And then the Holy Spirit messed things up in a good way. (laughs) Yes, yes, he's known to do. (laughs) So this is a non-Pentecostal church. These college students were smart, sharp. And so I asked them, I said, for this next quarter, what would you like to study? And they said, we'd like to study the book of Acts. 
and we would like to study the early church and but we like to study the phenomenon that happened there phenomenon. the suddenly <laughs> and so i said well i have to check with kent hickerson because i don't want to be you know <laughs> you, you get the picture yeah. <laughs> so i went to kent and i says hey what do you think this this is what they're asking he says great he says but don't make them crazies <laughs> That's what he said to me. And now what I said to him, I said, Kent, you know me. I know you. I said, I'm not going to make crazies out of them, but I want you. I want to warn you. If they study the book of Acts, they're going to ask questions, why is this not happening today? I said, you mark my words, it's going to happen. He said, nah, you can handle it. I went right over his head. So there was. Yeah, you can handle it all right. <laughs> That's why I'm bald today, okay? You handled it. <laughs> I hope the right way. So anyway, so two of the students took, one took healing, the other one tongues and interpretation. And they were intrigued by it. So I gave them some boundaries and guidelines in the study, and they were to write a paper, like a research paper, and then every week one of them would give their their research presentation. Uh, sort of like a, you know, like college campus. I mean, and I was enjoying it because, man, I don't have to prepare much. <laughs> I'm going to see what the Holy Spirit does here. Not, right. not that I wouldn't prepare, but it's like, okay. Well, the one gal that took healing, she laid hands, she'd studied, and she saw in Book of Acts that they laid hands on people, and they even anointed with oil, and then the Lord healed them. So she asked the Lord, is this true? And she prayed for somebody in the church who actually got healed. Okay? Secondly, there was another, and it was documented by the doctors. Too. Wonderful. Yeah, it was great. But the chairman of the board, his son was in that class. He's the one that studied tongues and interpretation. So... The setup is this, and you can imagine there's a setup. He studies, but the night before he's to give his presentation, I kid you not, Saturday night, about 11 p.m., he's asking the Lord, Lord, if this is real, what I'm reading and studying here in your word, if it's real, give it to me. And he said, immediately, immediately he began to speak, and he could not shut up. <laughs> his dad, like, Get this. His dad's the chairman of the board. Wonderful man. He goes upstairs speaking in tongues, <laughs> trying to tell his dad, this is what happened, dad. And his dad was very kind and says, now, now, son, calm down, calm down. Dad, I can't. It's so f I'm so happy, so full of joy, and I cannot stop. Well, his dad called Ken Hickerson, the pastor told him what happened. Then two weeks later, uh, Frida and our kids uh, had gone back to Kansas to visit her folks. So I'm there, and, you know, uh, he calls the, the elders. The, <laughs> the elder, one of the elders who I was really close with, he said, Ron, no, we need to come over and talk. <laughs> it was nice, and we were friends. We're sitting in the back of our deck in Kentwood, Michigan, and he he looked at me and he says, I love you, brother, but don't you think this is going a little too far? And I said, look, I'm not responsible for what the Lord is doing in these young people. God is doing that. So they cannot help but speak what they're experiencing, and they're going to talk about it. So what do you want me to do? And they said, we want you to be silent. And I said, well, brothers, you know I respect you. And they said, well, you know, we don't believe this. I said, well, you're going to have to find that out for yourself. And they said, well, we'd like you to be silent or else. And I, I knew the else meant... <laughs> We don't want you here. <laughs> but they were kind. They weren't, yeah. you know, pushy. So then what we did 
is they had a send off for us where they were sending I take it us. you took the URLs. <laughs> they had a send off for you. Okay. <laughs> You're right. It was a good send off though. I mean, it was a it wasn't you know the right kick of fellowship. It was right. it was it was a good send off. They had a they had in the gym, you know, and they had us and the chairman of the board, his son that got filled with the Holy Spirit, came to me that day, tears in his eyes, and he says, I want you to know it happened to me too. He says, but I'm not going to be silent. I don't know what ever happened there, but the very next week we knew that we needed to find a, a place of worship. Uh, Nate was um, entering junior high. He was about 12, 11, 12 years old, and our daughter was about nine and we knew that our roots were Pentecost background. So we went looking in the area for a Pentecostal church. And it's a true story. So we drove by Grand Rapids First Assembly on 44th Street. And when we drove by there, we were heading to another church. We looked at that church, and it was just a buzz. I mean, there were families and kids. The parking lot was full. And we said, wow, something's happening there. But it was a, a particular denomination that I grew up and heard my dad say, those folks are organized, so they're not in the kingdom. You know? <laughs> okay? So you can imagine. So we go to what was called the People's Church, which was another uh, larger Pentecostal church. I'd heard about it, had some friends that went there. And so this is Wednesday night. We're thinking, oh, man, we're going to get into this church, get to know them. Maybe this is the place. So we got there. The parking lot's empty. I kid you not. Empty. We go inside. I finally found a door that was open that was unlocked. I walked in, and I went into the sanctuary. It's empty. And I go walking around. I literally went down stairs, and there was a custodial care uh, gentleman there. And uh, I says, do you have church tonight? It was, it was advertised that they did. And he's, it was, this was summertime. And he says, well, in the summertime, we do not have church at the building. We have church in our homes. I said, cool. Do you know where we could find one of these? And he says, I don't know. <laughs> so I'm, what's going on? So we get back in the car. I drove back to the church that we drove by, Grand Rapids first. <laughs> we parked, went inside. We had to park way in the back. We walked in, and uh, the kids were able to go to different classes. And Frida and I sat on the back row, and we listened to our pastor, uh, Wayne Benson. And that night, he was preaching on the blood covenant. And I'd never heard. You ever walk in somewhere, and you just feel like you're home? That's how Frida and I felt. I've, we just felt at home. And so from 19, about 1980 to 2000, we were part of Grand Rapids First Assembly, and I was discipled again, but on a different level that I wasn't prepared for. Um, that's where I really got my teeth cut, if you want to say, on discipleship. Up to this time, I'd been discipled by several men, but it was just momentary periods of time but i was, was it was it always a i mean from that college days was it a passion of yours or no. was it till uh, no what happens first that it kind of grabbed your heart so looking back the best way i can explain my life it's been a journey of discipleship i did not i never heard the word disciple or discipleship when i was in college wow. i never heard the word growing up and I was in Round Church. I was in You for Christ. Forgot about that part of my journey, but I never heard the word disciple. Unless you were in the, the Last Supper presentations and you see the <laughs> disciples at a table, you know, and they're having the Last Supper. So anyway, um, moving forward, I was step by step, I was saying, I need I need to be poured into. I need to grow in Christ. And when I met Wayne Benson and part of the church there, and 
it's an amazing story uh, to us, to my wife and I, Frida. Um, we had been there for about six months, and we had already had a small group meet in our home, and one of the elders of the church was a leader of our group. And along the way, he would ask me to pray, he, uh, to ask us, Frida, sometimes to, what did you get out of the sermon? Because we, what we do, we would go over the sermon for that day. And, you know, you never hand the mic to a preacher. <laughs> he had a hard time shutting me up, man, because I was, I was learning and growing. And uh, the, the group grew from like six or seven to 24. And what we were doing is that we were meeting our neighbors in the community and say, hey, we've got a group meeting our home. And they were from a Lutheran church or Christian reform. And they were getting saved right in our home. And I said, this is cool. This is church. Well, D. Miller was his name and the elder that was overseeing. So he says, Ron, I, I can't meet next week. I can't lead. You're going to have to lead. I said, oh, man. Okay, I hope I, I hope I do what you Do you have any guidelines what you want me to do? He said, no, he says, you know what to do. You've been watching me. So that next week, I led. And then the following week, I led. And he did the same thing again for one month. <laughs> and then? Then he realized he wasn't coming back. <laughs> I would see him at church, and I said, what's the deal? He said, ah, you know, I got things happening. I just you can't get there. So it's a setup, yeah. So uh, two months after that, so we're leading this group. Two months after that, we started leading the group. Um, I had a call at, at supper time. So you had to imagine uh, Nate's about 12 at this time and Anna, and we had David too. And we're sitting there just having supper before Wednesday night. And about quarter to six, I get this call. And it's one of the pastors, and I could tell he's on a speakerphone, but I, I thought it was just him. So he and I are, uh, Tom Pierce is his name, so Tom... And I are having this conversation. He says, so, Ron, how's it going? That's how it started out. Said, Great. I'm sitting down having this fishing conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have all That's those pa patterns in your life. All right. <laughs> so he says, um, so we have a class, a marriage class on Wednesday night, and it's led by uh, another pastor, but he is unable. He's sick and unable to do this. Uh, we was wondering if you'd be willing to step in and teach. I said, so when does it start? He said, tonight. <laughs> I said, really? I said, do you have material? He said, oh, yeah, we got a syllabus. I said, well, how do you expect me to start teaching this when I haven't even studied it? And then Wayne Benson comes on, <laughs> and he says, now wrong. That no kid, if people that know Wayne would, it's now wrong. We've watched you. I have checked you out. And I, I'm confident that you're the person that God has chosen to do this. And I said, I've only been here seven or eight months. And he says, just, just try it. We, we're confident that you can do this. So I would like to introduce you tonight to the church so that they'll at least know who's teaching this class. He said, but we need you there at 6 o'clock because we have prayer before. So I showed up. First time I see the syllabus is I walk into the prayer room, and all these pastors are there, and it's a big church too. And I said, oh, what am I getting into here? And they give me the syllabus. We start praying. Well, I should back up. Before we start praying, um, Wayne Benson, Pastor Benson, says um, to the group, we want to welcome our new teacher tonight. <laughs> and they, it was called School of the Holy Spirit on Wednesday nights. And so, yeah. And then he says to me, um, would you stand in the middle so we can pray for you? And, ah. Uh, I was so humbled. 
here, and I didn't, I only knew Wayne, Pastor Benson. Excuse me for calling him Wayne. He's <laughs> so, so I stand, he prays for me. I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. Then we go out into the sanctuary. It's about uh, seven, 800 people on a Wednesday night for various classes. He asked me to stand and come up. So I stood and come up by him. He says, and he put his arm around me. He said, he turned to the crowd, people there, and he says, I want you to know that God has sent us a wonderful teacher, and he's going to begin to teach tonight on marriage. And I hadn't even looked it up to see what the subject is. You know what the subject was, Kevin? Finances. And that's another story in itself, okay? I'm the type of guy, when I, when I, when I first got married to Frida, it's like, if I had a nickel in my pocket, it burned a hole, okay? I was. And so when I told Frida she, she's doing what you're doing right now, laughing. So I go to the class, and there's 100 people. That's the size of a church. I go to class, and I look in the very back of the classroom as I begin. And I told them, I says, I haven't had an opportunity to study this course yet. They just chose me. So let's just get to know each other, okay? And I told them a little bit my, about myself, and I said, now, I know there's a 100 of us here, and it's going to take us a few weeks to just get to know each other. I said, but let's start out here in the front, just go around. And, and then, then we'll go to the back row. And so when it got to the back row, the gal stood up with her husband and said, why are you in this class? And Well, we are contemplating a divorce. The room went. Wow. Dropped the mic. It's like, oh. And, and I, I, said, I said to her, I know you. Where have I seen you before? She said, well, I'm the news anchor of TV8 in Grand wow. Rapids. I'm going, oh, that's wow. where I've seen her on TV. <laughs> so um, I began to teach that class, and for uh, our classes were like 12 weeks. Wonderful experience. I don't know if they learned anything, but I sure <laughs> did. You know what I mean? Uh, and so we were there. I sure, uh, right after that uh, teaching, um, I would say a couple weeks after that, I got a letter in the mail, two letters, as a matter of fact. There were two packets. The first packet was from the church board asking me to put my name in as a deacon. All right? I said, wow, I've only been here less than a year? This is, this is amazing. And so I had to fill out a lot of questions and uh, was about ready to send it. So I opened up the other packet. And it's from Wayne Benson, Pastor Benson, and saying, Ron, I've been praying over you, and I'd like you to consider being one of my elders. So I got a deacon packet, <laughs> I got an elder packet, and I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back, I'm saying, wow. Are, are you allowed to be both, or? Mm -mm. Oh, so you had to choose? <laughs> had to choose. And so I prayed about it. We went to another small group. We just happened to go to another s small group this one Sunday night and didn't know anybody but one person in the group. This guy's mother, we're in the group, and we had just gotten done with snacks, and we're just sitting there, and she looks over at me, and she begins to prophesy. I'm going, whoa. And everything she said was right on my history right up to that very night. And then she said, this is what God's going to do in your life. And that happened at the same time I'm contemplating whether I'm going to be an elder at First Assembly. And I was humbled by it. And I didn't feel qualified, to be honest with you. I mean, at that time it was about, I think about 2,500. It grew to 5,000. But at that time they had five services, which meant a lot of commitment. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I prayed about it, and then I had an interview with, with Pastor Benson, and uh, I had to sign a covenant. First time in my life that 
I signed a covenant. And uh, so I signed the covenant. I became an elder. And his concept of elders were more, were presiding elders because we had districts that we oversee. And so they had put me in a district. And by this time, I kind of figured out that, all right, I'm a disciple, and I need to make disciples. But I hadn't really made that many leaders, okay? Um, but what he did is he taught me a pathway of discipleship, a process and uh, of being a disciple and making disciples, uh, leaders, raising up leaders. And he had a process that he expected everybody in the church to follow. And uh, so I started doing it. I had a blast. For 20 years, they put me in one district, maybe 1,000 people in that district, and I'd start raising up leaders, developing groups in this house, develop a group in this house, multiply leaders, and, okay, let's launch you over there and over here. And it was just having a blast, enjoying the journey, doing that. And then they – Wayne Benson asked me to teach some of his his courses that he's taught before, and I was humbled by that. I says, "Whoa!" So he gave me his notes. I'd study his notes, and then I would develop um, a class. So, uh, when you had that, say thousand people that you got stuck or you you sent in the matter of there, and just trying to. Uh, pull out something from that for someone who's listening who uh, they're probably not going to get smack in the midst of a thousand but oh. they're putting it they're putting the neighbor they're putting they're, they're, God's put them in a neighborhood yes. and God's put them in a community uh, what would uh, just trying to uh, okay because uh, we're going to sh- start shifting gears here because uh, mm-hmm. I've realized that I'm going to this is going to have to be uh, multiple parts with you because there's depth here that we got to we're gonna have to mine we're gonna we're gonna be mining right. stuff so because <laughs> i haven't got to the whole sections of your story that i wanted to get to but uh, let's try and okay let's try and give so, uh, if uh someone is in and on this podcast we've talked discipleship before we had lee grady on and there's some others in episode one so uh there's we're starting to build something here but uh, if someone it's like, okay, I, I want to become a disciple maker uh, or I want to be uh, probably start with it. I need to be discipled. Uh, mm-hmm. I have not been discipled yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have any advice for them on uh, what that what they need to either look for or what that uh, next step would be for them that they feel like okay i i want to become a disciple maker but i probably need to be discipled first where should i start yeah good question and it's probably you probably could answer this being a prayer evangelist prayer guru if you want to say is this (laughs) seriously is if i've learned anything from you is the power of prayer but to stay focused on it So I learned a prayer to pray from my pastor, and he expected everybody to pray it. And that's Matthew 9, 38. Ask the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers into the harvest field. And he would always talk, teach us that that harvest field is Jesus' harvest field. But he's asking you as a steward to go in that harvest field, and when you get there, he is going to send workers to you. So I took that to heart. And I've ever since then, I have never looked for anybody. I keep praying. I don't mean this to like a super spiritual concept, but I pray that prayer. And I would go in, say a district was say 500 people. I would gather the leaders together and we would do prayer walks in their neighborhoods and silent prayer walks. Like we're not going around saying, you know, <laughs> Shandai on this house, you know, and you know what I mean? It was, it was very strategic. And so we would do prayer walks, and then I'd ask them to pray with me. Who in your group is God raising up? Who do you see God putting his hand on to be a leader? And they would apprentice that leader. And, and what, were they, what were they looking for when they say, uh, for, ex- that expression, they see God's hand on what? Did you give okay. them something specific yeah, that they're looking they're for? they're committed. They show up. 
Uh, they bring their Bible. They pray in group. They ask questions. They, they, they show an interest in the group. And then they ask you questions, too. Some will say, hey, um, so how did you get where you're doing this discipleship? And I would explain to them my journey. But I would tell them, you have a story, too. And part of your story is God has sent you to this group, and you have a story. So we would have them share their testimony in group. That's what I did as an elder because I learned it from my pastor. He said, pass this on. So that's, I, I looked for ob- people who were obedient, people who were hungry. And again, I, don't, let's say, I didn't look for them. Right. But the response was, is, I want to be here. I want to serve. You see somebody, uh, I would see in several groups, there would be people that would go around and clean up from the snacks. Uh, want to make sure everything is put back in place, um, would come and say to me, uh, w- w- what can I do? Or ask the, the leader of the group, what can I do? Can, can I do anything to help? Uh, do you want me to bring snacks next week? Um, even had some leaders, some people in the group say, um, when you go visit somebody, can I go with you? I didn't say no. <laughs> I said, Yes. So there was, there's, there's a lot of components there, but I always tell men I'm involved with, God sent you, I'm going to work with the sent ones. If there's anything that I think that we need to learn is not to try to push people down a road that they don't want to go down. So if, if someone is serving and they want to, they're eager to help, they're eager to serve, they've got a lot of questions, uh, they read their Bible, I would say also a big thing I watch for is do they journal? Are they are they in 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 group or in church? If they come to group and they have a journal with them and it's full of notes, that means that they're interested. Um, and so then, uh, from that point, when you see that in someone, because uh, you said you're not <coughs> not. Pers- I mean, you didn't say pursuing, but hey, the, I'm, I'm saying pursuing. And you're not. Uh, is there come a point where you have that conversation with them about it, or and yeah. what triggers that conversation compared to just kind of, you know, or maybe just kind of lead them in? I, I'm talking to the expert here, so you're leading them into the, uh, you know, just kind of when they say, "I want to go to the hospital," okay, come to the hospital, and then uh, that triggers mm-hmm. something else, or is there? A come a point where you do something more formal there. Well, I think where you're getting at, which is good, is relationship building. So I asked, <laughs> I would ask them, do you drink coffee? <laughs> drink pop? You ever been to McDonald's? <laughs> or do you go to Wendy's? Hey, you want to go and grab something? Sure. I'll ask them, Depend on how far along they are in their walk with Christ. Um, I'll ask them to read one of the main scriptures. Well, there's a couple of them, but I'll say, hey, before we get together, would you look at 2 Timothy 2.2? 2, and then when we get together, just tell me your thoughts. <laughs> yeah? And I can tell from just the start whether they read it or not or if that's what they're interested in. But whatever they... If they want to have coffee or pop or lunch <coughs> together, I'm going to do it. And I'm Frida doesn't like this, but I invite myself to people's homes. <laughs> well, and I've, I've seen, uh, I mean, here at Emmanuel, I've seen your relationship, how you, I mean, it's been, although it's not, like you said, you're asking the Lord of the Harvest to, but your your relational component has been very uh, deliberate uh, and very strategic and yes. uh, and and what I'd like to because we're we're running near the end of our time here. Okay. What I'd like like us I'd like to just point out for the audience uh, something that I see just as I'm hearing your story. Uh, uh, there were those people who. Uh, 
that you've mentioned that poured into you and tempered you and uh, probably didn't see the fruit of what, you know, even what you're doing now in, in ministry here, mm-hmm. uh, but they still made a choice t- to invest. And right. there is, uh, there's a, there's probably a listener now who's, uh, who sees someone and doesn't see the end result of mm-hmm. that process. The, mm-hmm. uh, and the multiplying effect of, I mean, when the people invested in you, they, uh, as a result, <coughs> they, they've invested in uh, uh, David, and they've invested in Nate, and, and, mm-hmm. and their mul- the effect multiplying yes. effect uh, of that. And uh, sometimes we, when we think about discipleship, well, we're just, you know, there's just this coworker that we're uh, pouring into and don't see down the road or the generations that are impacted uh, as a result and just uh, uh, just hearing your story is just uh, I mean an encouragement to me on that that front that Mm -hmm. you just keep uh, (coughs) the multiplying effect of discipleship uh, Mm -hmm. I I mean even thinking of the people the men that you've invested in here at Emmanuel and the it can be a, a generational change in someone's life uh, and uh, so I just want—I mean, I hope the listeners weren't just hearing a story of a man of God's journey, but also hearing that their story, because they probably have had weaves and turns through their sure. own journey, and say, "Okay, uh, God can use uh, that." Uh, the one other thing I would really like to do before we close the conversation. Uh, Boy, uh, over the years, I've uh, and this is where we'll probably have a part two at some point. Uh, when uh, talking to your sons, uh, they uh, various times, various conversations, they would talk about uh, coming home from something or the other, and you, you'd be sitting at the kitchen table and basically tell them what they had just done without having any uh, comprehension of what they <coughs> what had what had uh, transpired, uh, and. Uh, I, I say that not uh, just so the audience knows what we're dealing with here, uh, but uh, and you, you've been very uh, humble with uh, so I'm not. But I, I say that because I'd like you to take just a couple minutes. We're not going to take a. I know you and I could pray for hours, but I'd like you to just pray for our our, our listener that uh, w- two things. One that they would dare to challenge, uh, to ask that question, those questions about the Holy Spirit that you had those college students uh, do. And two, that they would take that next step uh, to, whether to disciple someone or to in that discipleship journey. Uh, would you be willing to do that as we wrap it up here? That would, I just think... Uh, a person like you, a blessing to someone like that. Uh, and it, again, they just uh, don't have to be long. We just <laughs> one day. I full I understand. Wow. Well, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. It's above all other names that we come and honor you. And you said you'd build your kingdom. You'd build your church. And you build your church through people. And I pray, Lord, for those that are listening, that, Lord, that you, first of all, that you would, they would understand that you hear their prayer. Lord, I I know there are many out there that they're hungry, they're praying, they're praying and, and crying out to you, am I significant? With what I do, does it have any long term? investment return in your kingdom and lord i'm praying for that man that woman lord that that's praying and reaching out to you and i also pray for those that lord you're blessing and you're sending people to and i pray a covering over them over their lives and lord i pray that you would bless them in the rising in the morning that you would bless them on their way. I pray that their hearts and minds would be open to the people around them and their hearts 
Lord, cry would be answered at that moment too. I'm asking you, the Lord of the harvest, that you would send the person that's praying to someone who will disciple them. And I'm praying, Lord, for those disciplers that know that you've sent them to disciple and they're hungry. And I'm asking you to send people to them. And I pray that in your name and for your kingdom, your kingdom, Lord, it's all about you, Jesus. It's not about me or what I can do. It's about you and what you want to do through us. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, again, thank you, Ron, for being uh, here today and uh, taking the time. And again, I have lots of questions, so maybe we can uh, we can tackle that again some other. Or maybe you and I'll have coffee at Wendy's sometime. And well, <laughs> well <laughs> I just found out you like Wendy's. Okay. <laughs> All right. God bless, and uh, thanks for being here. Thank you. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Ron Roosh. Uh, if you're looking for more uh, ideas on disciple making and relationship uh, building, uh, let me encourage you to check out as well episode one with Lee Grady and also episode 13 with Chris Maxwell. Both of those will give you some uh, things more to dive into. But as I said at the beginning, I hope that you uh, were listening in with an ear to how God was developing uh, Ron in the process of becoming a disciple maker so that he could uh, do that for others and so that as you find those clues you too can uh, allow that into your life so uh, let me encourage you as I did at the beginning if you found uh, you know two three even one thing that uh, stood out to you of how he grew in that process uh, reach out to me on uh, social media uh, we're again at Christ Connection uh, for Facebook and enjoying prayer for Twitter and if you wanted to find those other episodes that I mentioned, go over to uh, ChristConnection.cc slash podcast. And, uh, and while you're there, check out all the other resources that we have uh, to help you as a follower of Jesus, because that's what we're all about, uh, helping people grow in adventure with Jesus. Uh, so again, that's ChristConnection.cc. Uh, but until t- next time, thanks for listening.